Join the party, go to spectator.co.uk and get your first month absolutely free. Rod, looking back at uh, The Spectator's greatest hits this year on our website, um, it's fair to say a large number of them uh, have been about Harry and Meghan. There seems to be an amazing amount of interest in them, uh, and particularly in pieces that are not very favourable towards them, um, including a couple by you. Why is it that people seem to uh, dislike them quite so strongly? Because they're vacid, vacuous, privileged and hypocritical. I think that sums it up rather neatly. Um, and partly because, of course, they've done a lot of damage. I mean, they've done a lot of damage to the royal family, which um, a majority of people in this country still have some respect for, certainly some respect for the Queen and, and the sadly departed Prince Philip. Um, and they have done untold damage to it, uh, uh, more even than Harry's mum did to it, uh, I suspect, uh, when we come to tot up all these reckonings at the end of the day. Um, but more than anything, they are so blatantly risible, sitting out there in a Californian mansion with 18 lavatories, an untold number of which have working B-days, um, uh, uh, and lecturing the rest of us on the uh, need for equality. Uh, and there's this kind of vacuous concept of equality, which is always championed by um, uh, American left wingers and doesn't actually mean equality at all. Uh, and the, the other thing, obviously, which is the most common thing often said of them, is how desperately they desire their privacy. And tell us this through various conduits every day of the week. Um, and sign deals with companies such as Netflix, presumably in order to protect their privacy even more through having fly on the wall documentaries and so on. They are hypocrites of the most outstanding order. And the term champagne socialist could have been invented for them. Well, perhaps their, their desire for privacy might explain uh, what's gone on with the Spotify deal that they did for um, a, a large number of millions. Uh, and they have only produced one episode in a year. And uh, I, I'm sure, like, like me, you regularly check your Spotify's feed to see if they've, if they've uploaded another one. But so far, no. Well, they have a problem. And, and so, obviously, to the, to the companies which have employed them. And the problem is this, that... Uh, they are caught between uh, a rock and a hard place. They have, to, they have to, for the sake of their current brand, reject everything that the royal family stood for. But without having the imprimatur of the royal family, they amount to nothing. They're, it's just a, a gingerish hairhead and his pushy misses jabbering. Uh, unless, that, unless that connection to the royal family is kept, there is no reason whatsoever why anyone should want to watch them. Well, they've, uh, they seem to be trying to create uh, a very Americanized version of the royal family for the American media market. Do you think, although it might drive Brits like you and me uh, a, a bit crazy or, or, or make us cross, uh, Americans actually are quite receptive to that kind of thing? Well, except it's nothing to do with the royal family. Uh, and celebritydom and being a royal are not similar. They're certainly not the same, but they're not even similar. They require different qualities. Um, Celebritydom requires endless um, self-publicity uh, and the endless emoting um, on any one of a number of given issues. Being a member of the royal family requires precisely the opposite of that. It requires diligence, uh, dignity, reserve um, and selflessness, all of which are antithetical to the concept of the celebrity. So they can't get away with this. And my prediction is that they won't get away with this for very long because they will cease to be seen as anything of any importance because that connection with the royal family has been broken. But do you think it's partly the royal family's fault for before Meghan came along? Um, I mean, for decades now, 
the royal family has danced with the world of celebrity and, and, and th through, the, through the medium of the tabloids. It's, it's flirted with PR and, and promotion and, and publicity. It, it, it hasn't done so anywhere in, the, anywhere in the league of what Harry and Meghan have got up to. It is true that the Queen has sometimes been dragged screaming towards the PR people, all of which began, I think, recently with, with, uh, with the advent of Tony Blair. Uh, in Downing Street. Um, and perhaps they have gone down that route too far. Uh, and of course, Harry and Meghan aren't the royal family's only problems. You know, there's, there's, there's the magnificent figure of Andrew lumbering around in the background as well. So it's not been a good year for the royal family. And you might argue it's not been a very good decade for the royal family. Uh, and you do get the suspicion that this whole thing is rather coming apart at the seams. Well, the suspicion seems to be that um, once the Queen goes and uh, she can't live for much longer, um, the, uh, the things will fall apart quite quickly because it's been the Queen's reserve and her unwillingness to um, engage in PR, something Prince Charles has engaged with a bit more, that, that, that has kept the royal family the show on the road. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. And of course, the passing of the Duke of Edinburgh was was a terrible thing. Uh, uh, I mean, a tragedy, obviously, for the Queen and for the Duke of Edinburgh, I suppose, uh, but a tragedy also for the institution of the royal family, because the two of them personified that selflessness, that, uh, that dedication to duty, which is meant to come with being a modern royal. Uh, there are a few glimmerings of hope uh, in um, uh, William and Kate, uh, who are beginning to show that same sort of decency and reserve. I just wish they'd stop talking about mental illness every 30 seconds. <laughs> um, or I mean, it, it is difficult to find anyone in public life in Great Britain who doesn't immediately tell you how depressed they are and seeking treatment for it. I don't know what's happened to this country. Uh, but in the interim, we have to put up with Charlie, of course. How much better it would be if it were Anne, uh, but instead it's Charlie. Uh, and I dare say there will be one or two problems there. He is also given to making uh, fatuous political statements uh, about which he knows naff all, as Anne might put it. Um, so uh, we will just have to see. It does seem, I, I mean, you look at the polls, there is still support for a monarchy, but it decreases, and it decreases uh, gradually every year. Um, and... Uh, you, one, one would expect that that would continue to decrease. Do you find, I mean, I imagine by instinct, uh, I think I know by instinct, you're not a, you're not a monarchist um, uh, and I don't think your politics make you uh, inclined to support the monarchy, but do you find that the sheer ghastliness of Harry and Meghan um, makes you fonder of the Queen and the idea of the, the older idea of the monarchy? Oh yeah, well, two things. Yes, I mean, obviously Harry... Harry and Meghan uh, make me feel more kindly disposed towards almost everybody else on the planet <laughs> by, by comparison. I mean, that absolutely ghastly individuals. Um, that, 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 that continual whining. Um, but the other thing which makes me more kindly disposed towards the Queen and, and our current royal family, and even Prince Charles, is the prospect of what utter dunderhead would be elected president if we didn't have a royal family. And you can see it now. Uh, it would be some worthy from the left. Uh, it, it's quite possible that it would be uh, the famous actor David Tennant, or, <laughs> or what's he called, that Sheen bloke, uh, or Eddie Redmayne, or Baldrick from Blackadder. You know, and that's why we have a queen, so that we don't have to put up with someone like that. Well, I think we'll end it there, Rod, on that cheery note. Happy Christmas. <laughs>